titled Reforms, Time for Version 2.0. To discuss this, I'd like to invite on stage Mr. Keshav Murugesh, Mr. BVR Mohan Reddy, and Ms. Vinita Bali. Please also welcome our moderator, Mr. Raghavan Srinivasan, editor, The Hindu Business Line. Ladies and gentlemen, reforms, time for version 2.0. Thank you very much and uh, a very good uh, afternoon to all of you. Um, the topic today, <coughs> you know, is reforms, time for version 2.0. But uh, as several speakers in the session were just uh, ended before this, pointed out, uh, you know, even the framing of the title of a discussion uh, presupposes certain things. One of the obvious presuppositions in this session is that the process of reforms which started in uh, 1992 uh, has run its course and that uh, the other unstated assumption is that whatever that process managed to achieve, and there are, it managed to achieve considerable amount of success. You know, this city that we are sitting in, Bangalore, it is an example of the impact of economic reforms in India. I visited, I've been visiting uh, Bangalore uh, you know, from 1980. And I have seen the transformation of the city into the kind of global economic growth engine that it is today. And that has happened largely in the post-reform period, and one could argue largely because of reforms. So it has achieved, but as I was mentioning, the other unstated assumption is that there you know, certain things have, certain goals or certain milestones have not been achieved, and therefore, perhaps we need to have a fresh look at the reforms agenda. So, I'm actually going to kick off this discussion we have by questioning my own assumptions, questioning these assumptions. So, first, has the process of reforms which we started, uh, has it truly run its course? In the sense that, have we achieved what we set out to achieve when we undertook the process of economic reforms in India? And do we today face a set of challenges uh, whose solutions are no longer possible by adopting the kind of reforms that we did in the first phase. So that's the first question. And perhaps we could just start off from this, uh, you know, starting with uh, uh, Mr. Reddy, because uh, you started your company in 1991. So pretty much you've been through this entire journey uh, and been a critical part of it as well. So thank you, um, Mr. Srinivasan, and good morning to all of you. Is this mic audible, please? Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mr. Srinivasan. Um, there is a um, uh, very close relationship between my becoming an entrepreneur and this uh, country opening up uh, its borders, uh, embarking on the strategy of liberalization and globalization. So we sailed together. And this is not uh, a momentary issue. We continuously saw the uh, various reforms that happened over a period of last, uh, say, 38 years or so, or 37 years. And uh, including, I guess, the last one uh, that happened was the reforms centered around GST, for example. Um, or prior to that is NCLT. So all of these are, it's, so therefore to me, reforms is a continuous process. Now have we achieved the results that we require? If you look at one single instance, the one which really drove uh, the then prime minister and the finance minister was our inability to pay uh, the debt we had with foreign institutions. And from that situation, where are we today? We're about $235 billion plus in foreign exchange. So if you look at that particular point, 
Where is the economy? I think from a Hindu growth rate that we had, we certainly moved into numbers which are say 8% on an average for the last 10 years or so. Or we had a stock exchange, we have a stock exchange at this point of time which has a market cap of 2 plus trillion dollars. So in several ways, I think we have definitely achieved. Can they be better? Certainly life is always could be better by doing things differently. I think there's some of the areas we could definitely ensure, <coughs> excuse me, my throat is not as bad as Ram's but I'm getting there so it goes <laughs> Uh, I think we could have probably done much better uh, in doing a few things. For instance, if you look at um, the regulators that we have had, some of them we work very closely is, um, say, SEBI. I think they have done a phenomenally good job. Or um, you look at next one is TRE, uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. Um, you can say, yeah, we could have done much better than what it is. I think the key in terms of reforms and regulation, in my perspective, is that we are missing out the big picture in terms of defining the exact role to be played. An area of key interest to me of recent past is more of education. There, you know, there's so many of them that are there at this point of time, so many regulators, whether it is UGC, there's AICT, each one of the verticals have their own regulator associated with it. I think we can debate that, but, but, uh, de debate it better by ensuring that, you know, we can put a framework and say, what do you want to achieve next? I think that's an interesting point that if you define sort of reforms as the transition from direct government control for everything from, you know, how much stock you could issue at what price and when to, you know, basically letting, you know, entrepreneurs and businesses take these decisions on their own and let the market determine the answers to that, but having a set of rules uh, which are enforced by a regulator, an independent regulator. We've had a mixed experience uh, of this transition, some good, some bad, and we'll come back to that point later. But Vinita, I want to ask you this. Uh, first, you know, if we have by and large achieved the kind of goals that we wanted to achieve, unleashing entrepreneurial uh, you know, uh, abilities in this country, which were always inherent, uh, transitioning India from what uh, Mr. Reddy mentioned, the Hindu rate of growth to a, a sustained higher rate of growth. We've had ups and downs, but we've never really sort of dipped below uh, uh, to the traditional growth rate of 3 to 4 percent. Um, if that has been so, uh, don't you think that the Indian economy should be in a different place than it is now? Don't you think that we should have had by now many more Indian global corporations than we do have today. And don't you think that, you know, despite the size of our economy, which is also a factor of population, um, our sort of economic leverage in the global stage should be higher than it is. So the question really is that, has, has the, have the goals been achieved? Uh, you know, some goals have been achieved. If we think of it in economic terms, then yes, as Mohan said, we've, uh, you know, our rate of growth post-1991 is almost twice what the Hindu rate of growth was. Uh, we have created new industries that didn't exist. Have we created global corporations? Uh, you know, we always like to compare ourselves with China. And the answer is not really. Um, our economic growth story has been led more by domestic consumption and that is also understandable because we, we you know, came from a situation where most markets were underserved and undermarketed. So in economic terms, yes, we've got a pretty decent rate of growth, 75 to 8% over the last you know, decade or so. I think the bigger question for India from the point of view of reforms is that certainly the expectation was that economic growth would translate itself into other avenues of growth, whether it is in education or healthcare or other things. You know, yes, uh, life, you know, the longevity has gone up. But uh, if you look at, if I were to triangulate this, we were talking about facts and data in the earlier session. If I were to triangulate this differently and say, when it comes to human development index, which for example is a more comprehensive measure of a society's development, you know, India ranks 130 out of 186 countries. 
when I look at reforms in healthcare or in education or in labor. Uh, you know, take something that we are very proud of, that, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, companies hire contract labor because our labor laws are very onerous in terms of firing people. The result of that is that it is actually hostile to the labor whose interest we are trying to protect because the contract labor is paid less than permanent employees and so on and so forth. So I think when it comes to labor reforms, when it comes to reforms in healthcare, in education, and certainly I think healthcare and education are very critical because, you know, on the one hand, we can't keep talking about our uh, you know, our population as being a dividend for us. I actually believe it is a liability. You know, when 50% of the world's stunted children live in India, when one third of the world's wasted children live in India, um, you know, that's not a good statistic. And, um, you know, we've just had all this controversy over the NSSO data with the unemployment and so on. Um, you know, if indeed there is 15 or 16 percent reported unemployment, then where we are heading to and the solutions that we have to find for that future have to be very different from relying merely on GDP growth, which, by the way, is a very small indicator of how, you know, nations perform. I mean, it was invented, what, in 1934 by Simon Kutzner, and it just measures, a, you know, one sliver of a, a, a nation's development. So I think we've got to triangulate, we've got to look comprehensively, we've got to look ahead, and we have to say what role is India going to play in the global world. Uh, we are certainly not a global player, in my view, as of now. Okay. Keshav, uh Clearly, your views uh, resonate very strongly with the audience, and uh, I, I, I'm really glad. You know, it's very interesting that both of you actually, uh, you know, stressed on education and the human capital factor uh, in our growth story, and it's something which, uh, you know, I was having a chat with Keshav before the session, and that's something which he's also uh, very, very passionate about. But I, Keshav, I want to ask you this: you, you know. Your business is also a post-reform business. Uh, in many ways, you, your business relies on this human capital that we speak of, the demographic dividend that uh, India enjoys, in theory at least, in terms of the youth of its population and the number of people in the workforce. Um, one could say that, you know, maybe, you know, our, because our population is uh, so large, even if you just skim the cream, the cream is so large that, you know, it can sustain a large number of these things. But do you think that, you know, if the goal of reforms, the larger goal of reforms was to sort of uh, ensure economic growth and development, um, and in the, in, in the larger context that Vinita uh, mentioned, that it's not beyond, not, not just GDP, but in terms of human development, overall human development indicators, do you think we are getting there? Are we at least on the right track? Um, what is your experience, uh, particularly in sort of, you know, dealing with the human capital side of the equation? Thank you, Ravi. So first and foremost, now I must say I, we are in violent agreement, you know, the three panelists here in terms of, you know, some of the things that they spoke about. I, I'm in full agreement. But I also belong to a business that, you know, follows what John F. Kennedy said. So he clearly said, you know, don't keep waiting for what the country is going to do for you. You focus on what you're going to do for the country, right? And therefore, if you look at our business, the IT business, and more particularly, the business process area that I belong to, what we did was we co-opted the government as part of our long-term journey, right? And we didn't wait around looking for SOPs and waiting for reforms and waiting for the government to announce things. In fact, I would go as far as to say that we created a business out of areas which nobody, even the client, didn't want to create or didn't want to run themselves back office processes, right? 
and we created billions of dollars of market cap uh, you know, out of these businesses. So if you just look at how we did it, already over the last you know, decade or a decade and a half, we have seen three iterations. The first iteration of our business was all about you know, playing the wage arbitrage model. Then we went to value beyond cost. And today it's all about business transformation. It's very clear, you know, every leader in the world clearly says that I cannot run my company unless I have access to the kind of talent that India is producing. And companies like ours, as well as you know, many other companies that belong to the so-called NASCOM kind of group or uh, similar groups, actually are transforming the business. Now, just look at the impact we have created. What we depended on the government was to really help create the STPI program, the Special Economic Zone program, and we you know, really explained to them what benefits it could create and what long-term impact it could have for India. And just fast forward a few years now, look at what the BPM business alone has created. 17,000 companies, 1.3 million employees directly involved, 3 million people indirectly associated with the industry, $37 billion of revenues, 37% uh, of the world's business process uh, business, 25% of India's you know, $170 billion of exports from IT, very importantly, 35% of the people working in our business are women, right? So if you just look at the way we have done all of this, taken our business into tier two, tier three, tier four locations, we have made the government stand up, take notice and say, here is a business that creates employment, uh, walks the talk, and therefore, you know, is constantly reinventing itself to be relevant. Look at the new programs we are running. And Ravi, you and I once chatted about this years ago, and I came to you with a problem. And this is a very interesting uh, discussion, so I must <laughs> raise it here. I came and told him, look, everyone refers to my business. I was chairman of the NASCOM BPM Council at that point in time. They refer to this business as the BPO business. And every newspaper article about the BPO business is a negative article. Bridge collapses in Noida. Ex-BPO employee dies. Uh, somebody molested outside Bangalore after being dropped by, a, by, you know, by the company transport. Ex-BPO employee involved. Things like that. I mean, nothing to do with the currency of the situation. So I said, you know, what, how can I help, or rather, how can you and the media really help to position the story very differently? Because I just reeled off so many statistics. And he said, he said, you know what, people are upset and not very happy with the progress and the kind of impact your business has made. Because your people have more money, your people are consuming, your people are actually buying houses, your people are buying cars and scooters, your people are taking credit cards. Therefore, the Aam Janta is not very happy. So the great advice I got at the end of that meeting was to change the terminology from BPO to BPM. And then I spent a lot of time, two years, interacting with the media, explaining to them what all we actually have done in this business to transform our business. And today, I'm really proud to say that we are creating, you know, across NASCOM and the entire IT world, a new, you know, future skills platform that will now skill 4 million people, you know, in, the, in, in this country. Not only people who are entering the workforce, but also people who are already in our companies and who may be becoming digital dinosaurs because the world is changing so much thanks to technology disruption. So I'll stop here, but clearly, there's a lot that can be done. I am personally very excited about the kind of reforms that, were, that came out in 91, the kind of new ideas that came out in the past four years as well. For me, I think executing those ideas extremely well is where we should now focus. I think you've sort of... Uh sort of caught on to the great Indian weakness. We're great at ideating and really poor at execution. But, you know, I just want to sort of pick up on a couple of things which Keshav said uh, and come back to the larger discussion about the reforms agenda, you know. So one of the things you mentioned, for instance, was reforms, 
one of the one of the changes it brought about and uh, an enabling environment was provided by the creation of STPIs and special economic zones. Now both have run their course. STPI sunset clause is over. Uh, SEZs are rapidly being actually, uh, you know, dismantled or converted to something else. Uh, it's just a land bank game now. And uh, in the larger context, if you look at it, some of the successes of the early wave of reforms was because the government occupied so much of the economy. It had lots of room to play with. You could do tax breaks, you could do this scheme, you could do that scheme. Now we have moved into a GST. One of the things which GST has done is that it has practically knocked off most of the incentive plans for industry because they were almost always based on tax cuts. You know, excise duty rebate, you know, customs duty rebate, some holiday. All those things are gone. You have a uniform tax, you pay it, and unless you complete that cycle, you don't get your input tax credit. So, so at one stroke, it's taken away one of the key tools that government had. The other point I want to pick up on is what you mentioned about doing this future skills platform, you know, training and skilling four million people, and that's great. And in fact, I think the success of even the Indian IT sector was because it basically managed to do that, you know, take a lot of raw talent and train it and skill it. You, you know, you have your Wipro universities or Infosys universities, but isn't that, you know, is the government, that, that's the industry doing the government's job, isn't it? You are forced to do this and it's an additional cost factor for you because you basically are not getting the kind of trained, employable talent that the education system should be producing, the kind of skilled workers in, 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 in the manufacturing sector that you should be producing. I read a, a recent study somewhere where one number has stuck in my mind, which is that in the manufa organized manufacturing sector, there was a study, they found that um, in, say for instance in Korea, 98% of workers in the organized manufacturing sector had received skills training. In India, the figure is just 5%. And we're talking about the organized sector, which is already into scale manufacturing, which is already using advanced manufacturing technologies, many of which developed by, uh, you know, Mr. Reddy's company. Um, and even there, you just had, you know, 5% of the workforce has actually been given formal skills training. So in that sense, you know, on one hand, you have the sort of basic tools that policymakers use, which was basically uh, woven around tax, that's no longer really available, or at least not in the kind of range and depth which was there. And it's one of the reasons why so many sectors are facing separate challenges right now, because the traditional incentives, and we are also transitioning, we are now part of various, you know, multilateral treaties and so on. So the export sector, for instance, has got a separate set of challenges because we now, whatever subsidy that we, a scheme that we come up with has to be WTO compliant and India has not really found a solution for that. So where do we go from here? You know, how long does business have to do the government's job? of training, you know, the people, of educating the people, just giving them the basic skills to earn a decent livelihood. And how do we sort of fix this? Uh, good question, uh, Srinivasan. Uh, I just want to, um, uh, probably my perspective was that uh, Azim Premji or Infosys uh, or Wipro are not doing it because government is not doing the job. I think they're doing it out of their passion. Just a small uh, uh, clarification. No, no, I'm not but talking about the sort of independent universities they've set up, but earlier the huge skilling campuses that they had in-house. Certainly, uh. uh, Srinivasan, the point you made is SEZs have um, uh, outlived themselves or the uh, STPIs have outlived themselves. Absolutely true. Uh, when at a point of time with, um, when India needed uh, some amount of impetus and these industries required some amount of support, I think the financial support was good. But I am a firm believer incentives are not going to help industry to grow. The government has the responsibility, at least you look back at our industry at this point of time, two major, two major uh, uh, inputs that we require. Number one is infrastructure. Number two is talent. Now, on the infrastructure part, I think we've come a long way. 
there's no denying it all. So I wouldn't comment more on that. But I'll go back to the skill part of it. There, I think we have an extremely uh, challenging situation, a disaster waiting for us. I've been working on uh, technical education for the last three months on this specific topic. What we found was, in India at this point of time as we speak, there are as many as 16,85,000 undergrad and graduate engineering college seats available. 16.87 lakhs. But the enrollment is no more than 51% of it. About 8.4 lakhs or so people enroll. So we created a capacity. We'll come to the next thing. But out of this 8.4 um, lakhs of people who get actually enrolled into the engineering education, they graduate somehow, about 95% of them. But actually, if you look at it, employability at the end of it is no more than about 31%, 32%. That's a stretch at this point of time. So what is the reason why they're not being employed at this point of time? Is because lack of skills, lack of knowledge, lack of the right learnings in the universities. And we go back to look at why is these universities or engineering colleges in such poor shape is because we did no planning whatsoever. Who act, there was no perspective plan that was created because if, if it probably 10%, 15% gap between the capacity versus enrollment, you could understand maybe, you know, geographic constraints are there. Consistently, you'll find in every state there are 50% more seats than are there, which means that they did not do the planning. What does that mean? Thereafter, it means we created infrastructure, which is idle at this point of time, in terms of land, building, uh, laboratories, and so on and so forth. Some of the staffing has also been created, which means that we don't get enough of staffing in the right capacity in the colleges which have better infrastructure at this point of time. So therefore, I think it's time for us to do the interventions. And as a result of that, you will also see this, uh, we, we can't call it fake news because some people say that it's true that engineering uh, graduates, M.Tech graduates are applying for jobs like sweepers and hygiene workers. There's a newspaper item yesterday. So therefore, I think the key thing is, if you don't have skill, are they truly engineers? Definitely not, 100%. And while we park that for a minute, we look at from the industry perspective at this point of time, people keep saying, no, no, IT industry is great, we did $168 billion industry, $124 billion out of the $168 goes for exports and so on and so forth. And it's all IT services that you guys were doing. Great. It was an opportunity, we touched on IT services. Everybody says we should now do more in terms of product, we should do intellectual property, and so on and so forth. There is a study which was done, out of the 1.5 lakh graduating computer science, uh, computer science graduating class, how many of them are fit for doing product development? And the number was 3.67%. So which means, again, you know, extremely dangerous situation that we are into at this juncture. So we need, at this point of time, enormous amount of interventions from the government, to make sure that this gets corrected. The reforms, we look at the, the interventions that could happen is I keep saying that we can't go and touch the students at this point of time. First, let's go and touch the faculty. Because the faculty itself is in a poor shape, to, which are in turn making these students much worse than they are. So I think the government has now started a few of them. We now have a new scheme which is running for creating more amount of PhDs. There is something called the Margadarshan scheme, where all, there are 23 IITs in this country, and each IIT is now uh, adopting five to seven local engineering colleges to improve their skills uh, at this juncture. And the other important thing that the industry academia interface also has to improve, we, had, we have a scheme called the Apprentice Scheme, which was never being used by industry. Here the fault line lies, does not lie just with a politician or a bureaucrat. I keep saying it's with the educationists, it's with the society, it was all of us. So therefore, if, um, because government has now um, uh, made sure that it got liberalized, there's more amount of regulation that's happening, people have started using apprentice scheme, and we're seeing some amazing results coming out of it. Because the skill levels of people are improving once they get into the industry. So interventions of this nature are happening, but I think there are big, larger problem that's there is about a regulator too. Regulator, we said, you know, was good, helpful, but I'll take it on uh, oh, later on. Then, all right. Yeah. No, very, uh, I think, you know, you've, uh, uh, Mr. Reddy touched on a um, couple of the key challenges. The other, but, you know, I think one area which gets neglected, and particularly in forums like these where, you know, industry is talking with 
and to each other is that you sort of don't look at the rest of the world outside you, you know. Uh, in our country, even today, about two-thirds of the population is rural and is largely dependent for a livelihood of whatever quality uh, on agriculture. And the entire sort of one of the underpinning uh, uh, philosophies behind even the original uh, set of reforms was to make sure that, you know, the share of manufacturing uh, in GDP grew substantially and uh, therefore created more jobs and livelihoods of a higher quality and helped move some of this population which is basically just subsistence level, uh, you know, uh, agriculture and transferred it to industry. But that really hasn't happened. Our agriculture challenge in one way has been met. We are a food surplus country. We are one of the world's largest agricultural economies. The real problem today faced by the agricultural sector is that, uh, you know, of actually ensuring remunerative prices to the farmers and ensuring that they're, you know, the, you get a reasonable livelihood. Production is no longer the uh, challenge. Although all our policies are still geared towards maximizing output without really looking at uh, the livelihood of the producer. But, you know, Vinita, since you were associated for so long with the food business and you had a very strong connect with agriculture, uh, do you think it's time for a focus shift on reforms, that reforms really, you know, industry can take care of its own problems, and I think the real reform really is in the agricultural sector, you know, freeing up the Indian farmer rather than freeing up the Indian entrepreneur. You know, uh, you couldn't have said it better, Raghu. I think we spend too much time solving the problems of the rich. Um, uh, you know, so agriculture is less than 20% of our GDP and employs 50% of Indians and India. You know, we talked and rightfully very proudly of our software industry. But, you know, when I look at software, it employs order of magnitude three and a half to four million people. Yeah. We have 35 million weavers who have no voice anywhere. If I look at agriculture, on the one hand, you know, we've been saying, look at our inflation rate, inflation is so low. But when you look at farmers and farm income, that is certainly not reflective of a country that is growing at an 8% GDP growth. Uh, if you look at the economics of agriculture, it is actually really detrimental to the farmer. We give fertilizer subsidies, um, we do MSPs, if you, if you work through the economics of it, um, if I'm a farmer who has two hectares of land, and by the way, there are out of 100 million uh, farmers, only 2% have more than two hectares of land. So we are really talking about small subsistence farmers. There is no way that you can make a decent living out of agriculture. So unless we tackle agricultural reforms, unless we make it remunerative for people to be in agriculture, unless we look at pricing which is based on the market and not on the basis of certain other economic criteria, we are going to end up treating the symptoms. And what do I mean by that? You know, again, there is all this big noise about farm loan uh, waivers. Um, you know, I was looking back and checking on the facts. The first farm loan waiver was given in 1990 by VP Singh. It was about 10,000 crores. Uh, the second one was given in 2008, which was about 52,000 crores. Between 2014 and 2018, farm loan waivers have been out of the order of magnitude of 180,000 crores. That is treating the symptom. We cannot, on the one hand, uh, you know, say that we are producing surplus food, and yet on the other, and again, I'm triangulating data, uh, you know, the latest report by FAO shows that there are 200 million chronically uh, hungry people in India. Out of 840 million people in the world who sleep hungry every night, 200 million of them live in India. You know, we can't have the aspirations to be a global economy and yet live with these um, you know, polarized realities where, um, you know, we are not recognizing where reform is needed the most, where it is needed most urgently, and where it is needed most significantly. And that is why, you know, reform has to address issues which are structural, not issues which are symptomatic. Again, take, uh, you know, 
even out of everything that India produces. Uh, 30 to 35 percent of it is actually lost in the process of the supply chain, in procurement, in storage, in distribution and delivery. Our food processing sector, you know, branded packaged food accounts for less than 15 percent of all food that is sold in India. So we are still very much, uh, you know, in the business of ensuring that staples are available. Another area that is crying for reform is the entire PDS system, which was designed actually precisely to, stay, to prevent people from staying hungry. But, you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, which we can go into if we want to, uh, it's not working. So those are the sectors that have to be addressed. And unless those fundamental issues of human dignity and life are addressed, I don't see how we can create sustainable and inclusive growth. So I think, you know, I think the challenges are very clear. So, you know, uh, whatever intervention that we do from a policy perspective, whether it's by the government or whether it's by practice, by, by in initiators, by industry or anybody, we need to keep in mind these three key challenges, education, healthcare, agriculture. Without that, really, we're not going to get anywhere else. But that doesn't mean that for those who are still, you know, in the this area, you know, other problems are sorted. I mean, if you take a look at the the kind of, you know, the, the, the what we are currently backing from a policy perspective, uh, from an economy perspective, is this whole amorphous thing called the startup ecosystem, right? So we have a startup India scheme, we have a startup fund. We are hoping that these startups, everybody will become an entrepreneur and create jobs and become a job creator and therefore solve the jobs problem. But what are we actually doing out there? What, are, what is actually happening to startups? You know, barely 20 have qualified for the startup funding under the government scheme. Uh, I read a survey there which said that about, uh, uh, you know, nearly 70% of startups have received an angel tax notification where capital is treated as income, which is very bizarre from a, you know, a taxation principle. But uh, uh, so, you know, it's not that, you know, so we have made things easy to start a business, so that, that objective of reform has been achieved, right? You can start a business, you can register, we've been shooting up the ease of doing business rankings. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's still easy to continue to do business. So what do you think should be on the agenda? We have the core focus areas, but for those in business, for this, this vision of startup India sort of delivering the goods and actually creating the kind of jobs and livelihoods for our millions of young people, for that to actually happen, what do you think needs to be done? So Ravi, again, you know, I must say that I am actually quite positive about all the steps that have been announced. And I think, like, as Mr. Reddy said, you have to keep on announcing reforms, changes, and you know, the 1991 reforms we keep talking about, but the reality is, Successive governments have kept introducing introdu interesting stuff and right. it has helped the nation progress. So similarly, if you look at what was announced recently, whether it is GST, whether it is startup, whether it is Make in India, you know, whether it is this whole AI policy, whether it is the digital policy, frankly, all of it is good, right? There's nothing bad about it. Yes. And I think it's a question of how execution is, you know, focused on over a period of time. I'm a big, big fan of execution because, you know, just announcing and not giving enough time to execute well is also a problem. So this whole startup thing, I think, is a very exciting thing because if you just, if you just look at it, uh, the entire media has been focused on this one issue of angel tax and things like that. In fact, yesterday, I think four companies received some notices, there, but I'm really delighted to see that already uh, some of you have reported that some of the news out there was not really true. Yes. Right? And which is wonderful, which means, you know, people are waking up, taking notice, and now presenting the correct news as well. That, so, for, from my perspective, I think all of these things are positive. I think as long as we can execute well and make sure that each of these, the starting problems associated with each of these policies is ironed out over the, you know, medium to long term, instead of everyone focusing on getting a job, you know, a lot of the youngsters in India will focus on creating new jobs. So, you know, I'm really uh, uh, very positive 
about the impact of uh, some of these initiatives. I spend a lot of time personally, uh, in fact, with Mohan uh, Redigaru on many uh, interesting startups interacting with a number of uh, young, smart people. And the kind of ideas that are available, the kind of potential impact, the kind of wealth generation you know, programs that are available in their minds are huge. And it's only a matter of time before which it is going to get harnessed. So sure. I am actually you know, very positive about the, uh, the potential. Excellent. Can I add, uh, Please. Uh, yes. add to what you know, uh, uh, Keshav said? Is that I think the root cause to me, there are a number of initiatives government has done. And, but I think the talent is still not there to become entrepreneurs. So therefore, the issue is, if we continue to have the rote method of learning, people don't challenge what is happening. And you, you, all that information anyway, what was, what was being told in the class is now available in the internet at this juncture. But you get into a mode where people start saying that there is knowledge and that knowledge can be used in innovation. That is when you will see a fairly large pipeline of uh, startups. Today, we, we find startups all right, but nothing of deep learning. That's where our concern comes. Therefore, interventions of making sure we probably will start changing our methodology of teaching, the pedagogy part of it, then creating incubation centers in education uh, uh, institutions, whether it's schools, colleges, etc. Bringing entrepreneurship as a minor, not necessarily everybody becomes entrepreneur, they could become entrepreneurs too. These are some of the interventions I think the government is working on currently to ensure we get a pipeline, and a pipeline which is of a good quality. Right. Can I add a slightly different perspective to this? I think we focus a lot on startups, but I do think what we really need is scale up. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money that is funding startups, but unless there is a scale up, which really is more structural, I think announcements of, you know, uh, initiatives, um, you know, whatever it is, Danjan, uh, Jandhan Yojana, yeah, yes. et cetera, et cetera, are great. But I think for it to have stickiness and to ha fundamentally change the way things happen, you've got to have a plan behind an announcement. You know, how is it going to happen? You've got to have that capability that is capable of delivering the plan. Otherwise, we've got a lot of capital chasing startups. We don't have enough scale-ups. Capital productivity, therefore, comes down. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is that there's a lot of emphasis on uh, returns on capital. I think for a country like India, which has 1.3 billion people, we have to start thinking of returns on labor just as much as we think of returns on capital. So I think, you know, sort of all of you have really sort of summed up the key challenges. I think the need to focus on core issues, the core, uh, that they're saying, agriculture, education, healthcare, the need to address uh, structural problems rather than treating the symptoms. And of course, I think all of you have underscored the need to execute. That without yeah. execution, all these are just pies in the sky. And, and job creation yeah. has to be fundamental as part of this in a country of this size. Yes. Right? So that's also one of the things that you know, I think all of us are very much focused on. And Wonderful. that doesn't happen by developing an app. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's more than that. <laughs> okay, I would, quickly, we are almost out of time, but I would like to take some questions from the audience. I see a hand there at the back, here and here. Four, maybe three or four questions. So let's start, since I saw that gentleman first, right at the back, please. May I request you to just make it a specific question and if possible, address it to a specific panelist. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, great panel. Uh, I may sound a little bit negative, I'm afraid, but I have to say something. Uh, last 20 years I spent in US and I just got back to India and I think we talk a lot about skill and strategy and all this, but I think execution is the most important thing that's missing. And more than that, I think the culture part needs to be addressed. Uh, for example, like the way I look at it is some companies and countries achieve more than their potential, some less. And where we know where we stand. So yeah, I get it. Uh, so what's your question? How are we going to address the culture aspect? Because I think culture is what is. Okay. All right. Okay. Would you would like? To well, that's uh, an issue which is important. We all recognize that uh, it's a slow process. I think there are interventions that's happening. If it's not, it, it has to have happen at home. It's not happening at home. It happens at the school 
or it has to happen in society, probably in the social media too. So these are the interventions that can always come in to make sure that the culture becomes better than what it is. And, and I'll add just one thing. In fact, Mr. Narayan Murthy yesterday spoke about this at a Thai conference. He actually said the best thing that we can do is to have these kind of discussions with our families at the dining table and, you know, just keep make sure, making sure that this discussion scales up to the whole of India. Cultural change starts at home. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, my name is Manjunath. I used to be with the news industry for the last 22 years and now, now I'm in renewable energy. The reforms are fine, but what about the synergy between the government and the private industry? For example, SM Krishna's time, there used to be something called BATF, Bangalore Agenda Task Force. You know, it used to have this, all these industry people and they used to interact with the government for all the policy matters and, you know, in fact, the infrastructure is a major problem in Bangalore. So is there some kind of a forum which you're planning, you know, for, to deal with the government, you know, basically for infrastructure and other things also? There are several forums that deal with the government. You know, there is the CII, there's FICI, there's ASOCHAM, there is NASCOM, there are, you know, every industry has a forum that deals with the government. Uh, so I don't think we have an absence of forums. In fact, we have too many meetings and too many forums. I think what we need but on the ground level, uh, what, are, what are the things that's happening? Yeah, so, so I think there are many ways of looking at it. Um, you know, so the, you know, one of the reforms that was created in the Companies Act was that every company has to have a CSR policy. Now, I actually think that, um, you know, I'm not sure if that was such a great idea, but if every company, on the other hand, were to think about how they can embed sustainability and a social issue into the business model itself, we would not need to say that here is my business and this is my CSR. Uh, you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about, which is a very big issue, is one on climate change. Uh, you know, that is going to impact agriculture, that is going to impact, uh, you know, fisheries, that is going to impact our everyday lives. And, you know, what is the role that society is playing or that government is playing or what are the kind of reforms that have to be created on things like environmental issues and sustainability in the absence of which uh, we, we are living in, uh, you know, potentially a period of significant and substantial risk. Yes, I think very, very important point and I'm glad that you brought it up here because uh, like I say, it's all very well to talk about, you know, plans and ideas. Uh, but you do need to keep the larger context in mind, and we touched upon it earlier in the discussion, the larger context in, in, in our country's context, but I think the larger context in terms of the planet is equally critical, so very, very important point there. Uh, yes, please. Sir. Hi. <coughs> so regarding the, this is for Dr. Reddy, sir. So regarding the education and how you can say the skills are not up to the mark, uh, I just wanted to understand that uh, are we looking into also that how service sector has contributed to the downfall of the education sector? That we, no. at one point, I will let me complete it, I'll give an example. We had institutes who were having less number of seats, let's say 10 number of seats. Now the service sector started coming in and they wanted to hire more people who may not be, and they were willing to offer them training. Now the institute started increasing the capacity, like you sh shared, that 51% of the, is the capacity utilization. If you look into that... No, I'll stop it here and then answer, because sure. you know, I also need to run to catch a right, flight. Yes. I need to be sure, very careful on that. I violently disagree with you on the point saying that service sector ruined the education system in this country. Service sector definitely helped. Um, Associations like NASCOM, CI helped in terms of making sure it's even the situation where it is at this point of time. So what has happened is at that point of time when there were no other jobs, every engineer, irrespective of whether it was mechanical, chemical, electronics, etc., they came all into the service sector or the IT service sector per perfectly. But today you might say, therefore, because the IT service sector is not recruiting the same number of people, so the quality is uh, falling down. No, I think certainly this sector, it's not IT services any longer, it's become technology sector at this point. And in the technology sector, there'll be more amount of jobs which has been created. With digital technology is coming, it's become all pervasive. Every industry you'll see a technology being um, a part and parcel of that industry. As a result, there'll be, I don't think we need more amount of capability and no, do not please blame that services sector has created the current situation. All right, fact, thank I'll you. Just add, I'll yeah. just add, I think 
it's very important for us to realize that job creation has to happen across every sector in this country. It can't be just one sector, right? And just to throw a statistic at you, even last year, where everyone was talking about job losses, net new jobs created by the IT sector was 150,000. And over the last three years, 650,000 net new jobs created by the sector. So the discussion should be, how do we create more jobs across every other sector as well? Yeah, I think, I think I, I'm, I'm afraid time is up and Mr. Reddy has to actually leave for the One airport. One last question, possible, uh, So, no, really, he needs to leave. Uh, so, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe you could take, uh, have it offline um, as soon as we, you know, uh, break for lunch. Thank but you so uh, thank you very much uh, once again for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, panelists. Thank you very much. Mr. Srinivasan, may I please request you to present mementos to our panelists? Thank you.